Hello and welcome to Healing from Historical Trauma, Understanding Trauma. This is part two of our Healing from Historical Trauma series. My name is BC Echohawk. I'm the Communication Coordinator for the SAMHSA uh, Tribal TTA Center and the Native Connections TTA Center. On behalf of our core and uh, alternate core, uh, Maureen Madison and Jan Dunbar Cooper, we welcome you today. Today's webinar will be recorded, so all lines will be muted. However, if you would like to make a comment, you're welcome to raise your hand or make a comment in the chat box. We will be following that. However, at this time, I would like to introduce our facilitators. Marie? Thank you, BC. Sigule Sigwe, Kajijalolux Neongets, Atnoa, Niwajitalot. So welcome everyone. My name is Marie Schuyler Drever, and I will be here to facilitate with you all um, today over and introduce you all to our presenters. The following subject matter experts helped us in creating this series, and we thank them for sharing their knowledge. Mr. Regis Picos of the Cochiti Pueblo, Ms. Ethleen Ironcloud Two Dogs, Ogallala Lakota Nation, Dr. Josie Chase, Mandan Hadatsa, next slide please, and Mr. Robert Brown of the Oneida Nation, and Dr. Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart, Hunkpapa Ogallala Lakota. Our objective today is to create education and aware, awareness of the historical trauma and its impacts on American Indian Alaska Native population. We'd like to introduce common language and understanding wherein we speak, educate, and share our experiences with historical trauma within our Alaska Native and American Indian nations and communities. To continue the supported efforts in healing from historical trauma and unresolved grief, and to provide examples of resilience and how we create action for healing from historical trauma. I introduce you now to Ms. Ethleen Ironcloud Two Dogs. She is not able to join us today. However, we have previously recorded her presentation that we will share now. I appreciate all of you joining us. This is BC Echo Hog. Rather than sharing the audio, uh, all of the audio at this time, we have some summaries that we're going to read uh, in, along with her slides. So for this one, we previously discussed traumas that the Lakota people faced, including the massacre at Wounded Knee. Survivors of this event were not able to have the ceremonies that normally would have helped them in facing and resolving their grief and extreme trauma. So in looking at intergenerational trauma, we can refer to this graphic. We can see at the bottom a 14-year-old boy who in school has been labeled a problem child due to behavioral issues. But we see that he lost his mother at a young age. His mother had also lost her mother at an early age and her father lost his father at an early age. Finally, we see the mother's grandmother, her father's mother, lost both her parents at wounded knee. This is layer upon layer of grief that is part of the boy and adds to whatever current challenge that young man is facing today. This grief impact can manifest, manifest itself in the ways we see on the left, but strengths such as survivorship, resiliency, and adaptability are also there. And we need to remember that also. So we speak to this in terms of the Lakota culture. And I'd like to just ask quickly, Dr. Chase, if she has any comments she'd like to add to this slide. I would just like to say that this is um, unfortunately a pattern that we see um, across indigenous tribes in North America because we have many um, common experiences in our histories, um, that being removal from our land, loss of our language, 
the boarding school experience, harsh and punitive parenting that all contributed to this um, pattern that um, Ethelene um, illustrated here. Also, I would just like to say from a um, scientific, so to speak, perspective, there's this um, whole field of epigenetics. And I know there's been some research done that talks about or looks at the effects of trauma in um, mice in particular, and that the effects of a trauma on a mother mouse creates a um, biological change or chemical change in the um, body chemistry and I think the brain chemistry in that this change um, is passed at least across four generations, four or five generations. So I think, you know, there's more and more um, evidence of these effects from, you know, a spiritual, emotional and psychological and um, physical perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chase. In this slide, we see a similar graphic that reiterates the path of both intergenerational trauma and strengths. We see another young child who's been labeled as disruptive and hyperactive, possibly diagnosed as ADHD. We see all the negatives, but not the history of what's happened to them. We act, react to them as a system, as they're the one who's the problem, but we don't look at what's happened to their family. We see here, though, their family has several experiences that have affected not only the family, but ultimately the child. Lakota cultural ceremonies that have historically been used for healing have not been performed, leaving trauma that can manifest itself in many ways. So we're seeing a lifetime of a need for healing. And when a healing plan is made, traditional Lakota ceremony should be considered, but little steps should be taken so they're not overwhelmed. I'll share a short quote from Ethelene about this process. Take little steps with them and to not um, expose them right away to everything, you know, to take them, you know, by the hand symbolically and to share with them the teachings and to love them unconditionally. You know, we have a word in Lakota, it's uh, tehila, tehila means to cherish, you know, so the, the intent is to cherish all children, to cherish them as sacred beings. And whenever they do have this pain and suffering is to respond to them, you know, as cherished beings, not as clients, not as cases, not as, you know, students or numbers, which those terms tend to objectify them, but to really relate to them as relatives, you know, and to to cry with them and to, you know, try to respond to them as appropriately as possible, age appropriate, culture appropriate, all of those things. We saw this slide in part one as Ethelene described the Lakota stages of life. Here we revisit it and see how history has caused an interrupted journey. Ceremonies do not take place and this causes an impact for an infant. It causes a weakening of the kinship system in Lakota society. And in the first stage of life, a lack of support can frustrate young parents to the extent that it might manifest as physical abuse. This would cause the child to be removed from the parents and placed in the foster care system where additional traumas can occur. The Lakota believe a spirit can leave the body while the body continues to physically grow. The child can go through the stages of life without any direction. It's at this time we can see suicidal ideation. By the third stage of life, we see alcoholism and substance misuse. If they reach this age, we see our adult members dying young, which leads to the fourth stage of life and a lack of elders to pass on teaching. This slide signifies the intense need to have culturally appropriate services throughout our tribal nations 
And again, I'll share a quote from F. Wayne. The intense um, need to make sure that we have culturally appropriate services. And notice I'm not saying Lakota culturally appropriate services. I'm saying culturally appropriate because we have so many wonderful people out there that can within their own indigenous nations, you know, know about, you know, the ceremonies to keep us in balance and to keep keep us strong, you know, and to for healthy development of our children so that they will become healthy elders. We are really in uh, a time where we really need to, I don't know if this is even a word, but culturalize, <laughs> culturalize everything that we do without excuse and without shame and without having to justify. In this slide here, if you look at the bottom, it says Wotakuya, the kinship system is weakened. And I think that's where we can start among us people that are listening and those of us that are in this in this webinar you know we can look at each other as relatives and we can treat each other as relatives now if we turn around and we look at you know the people that we work with in our own individual workplaces and if we look at them as relatives and then if we were to look at you know the people that come to us for help that are depressed that are lonely that are in pain and suffering if we look at them as relatives first that would change the dynamics of how we approach people and it would also change the dynamics of how they engage with you know the services and the people that are providing the services a very pivotal now, thing for me i got my masters in clinical social work and that was in 1974 and i started some psychoanalytic training and i started to become aware of genocide across the globe so i just remember having a sort of epiphany looking at some historical photos of our people and i just got overwhelmed with this deep grief and that's when i first had that thought about historical trauma and unresolved grief and called it initially like the historical legacy. It was almost like one of these sort of um, really important and I felt sacred knowledge that was being given to me to help our people. And so I've had that commitment ever since then. So there's a sacredness to this work and it's been for many, many, many years. We've made this commitment and we've continued that commitment. Dr. Chase, did you want to add anything to that? That was the voice of uh, Dr. Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart, who couldn't join us today, uh, but we had her recording. Yes, I would like to um, go back a little bit, if I could, to um, Ethelene's slide and, you know, talking about we are all related. And, you know, that's true both. Um, literally and theoretically um and you know that's part of the knowledge that has been lost in in as a part of the um you know forced assimilation the genocide so that i you know um in your introduction you said that i'm mandan and hidatsa uh from North Dakota in, you know, and I am on my father's side, and I am also Hunkpapa and Yank Dene, um, Dakota and Lakota on my mother's side from Standing Rock. But I, I would wanted to say that um, in many of our tribal languages, there are no words for um, aunt or uncle or, um, you know, other kind of extended family, we're all related versus um, through, uh, you know, mother, father, our, our mother, sisters are also our mothers, you know, our, our father, sisters, our esteemed um, older sisters and um, 
The same goes for our fathers and our grandparents so that we don't have words for cousins and, and that ex distancing kind of language so that back in you know pre-European days, there were no orphans. Um, we were all related either through blood or marriage or clanship. So we had that kind of um, safety net built into our societies. So I just wanted to add that. Now, if we could go back to the other slide, I would just like to say that um, Dr. Yellowhorse Braveheart and I met in the mid um, 80s. And we, I think, separately had this kind of calling to dealing with this deeper um, grief and loss and trauma because we are both clinicians. And um, however, over the years, we've had the opportunity, and I do believe in that um, spiritual calling and guidance that led us on a long and winding uh, road to um, implement and train and share our work around um, healing historical trauma and unresolved grief. So um, through a series of grants, you know, we um, have had the opportunity to work with many tribes across the US and Canada um, through presentation, presentations and training, and also to do some uh, parenting, native parenting work that um, we had a project that we conducted um, with that and our, our curricula, curriculum is actually being um, utilized in, in other projects um, for healing um, or helping parents. And in one of our, our original projects, we learned that, you know, the parents verbalized the issue of their own trauma that they had experienced either, you know, with their parenting, their own parents or um, through boarding school and that they needed to heal before they could even learn um, better ways of parenting. So we incorporated that into a parenting curriculum and it's been very well received. Um, I just would like to say that um, we had in 2001, we had a, national and actually international conference um, regarding historical trauma and a couple of follow-up um, conferences where we brought together other um, clinicians and participants who came from um, massively or group uh, massively traumatized groups such as um, African Americans and Asian Americans, Latinos. So um, the work has spread over the years. And um, in 2009, our historical trauma and unresolved grief um, model was selected as a tribal best practice by First Nations Behavioral Health um, Association. So, um, you know, the work continues and has thus far culminated in an NIMH funded study where we looked at um, healing depression and um, anxiety and trauma in um, two tribal sites at two diverse um, locations, one in the Southwest United States and um, one in the Northern Plains area. And we've um, written papers about this. And I, I think this may be, we've published yeah, papers and um, the project was called Iwankapia, Healing Historical Trauma and Unresolved Grief Among American Indians. So um, we feel honored to have, you know, carried this work. And, and I think, you know, when you look at genetics and our family histories, um, we can trace, you know, a lot of what we talk about in, in our own families. And so therefore we're able to provide a different insight per se, um, as opposed to your typical Western 
um, psychotherapy intervention. We integrate a lot of our culture into it, and we'll talk more about that as we go on. Thank you. So we define historical trauma as cumulative emotional and psychological wounding across the lifespan and across generations. And it emanates from massive group trauma. The historical unresolved grief is the grief that accompanies all that trauma. And it hooks in with our other kinds of losses and grief. And it's cumulative, meaning that it's layered and that it's something that we carry. And so we work at healing that by acknowledging that, not being afraid to confront this issue for us and the emotions that come with that. So in our intervention work, we address that. So I think we can go on into um, the next slide and <clears throat> talk about the historical trauma response uh, features or historical trauma response. Um, it's a constellation of features that are in reaction to the massive group trauma that our people have experienced. And this response is observed among not only Lakota, but other native populations, other tribal populations, um, the Jewish Holocaust survivors and descendants, Japanese American internment camp survivors and um, African American descendants of um, slavery. It's kind of like we put this pressure on ourselves that we are able to make up for what happened to our ancestors so that we are sort of trying to compensate for the damage that has been done to our people, but we're not responsible for that. The way we relate to it is as if we are responsible in some way that we somehow caused this and that we have to fix it. So it can be a burden on our people and I think that adds to that. Deaf identity is sort of fantasies of reunification with the deceased and a sense that we've cheated death so that we really don't deserve to be alive or happy if we are alive and vibrant. And a lot of these things are unconscious, but it affects our behavior, our mood, our relationships. And then preoccupation with trauma and death because it's so prevalent in our communities that this COVID era has really been hard on our people because we already had high death rates and we've had a lot of losses of our relatives from COVID. So we become sort of preoccupied with trauma and death. It's so much a part of our life. Then we internalize the ancestral suffering so that loyalty turns into playing out unconsciously in our own lives, sort of perpetuating our suffering because we feel guilty if we're happy because our people suffer so much. Hypervigilance, that's staying in that heightened state of alertness and being on guard, waiting for the other shoe to drop. You're always expecting trauma and it takes away energy from us to do positive things in our lives. And then we also see that vitality in one's own life is seen as a betrayal to our ancestors who have suffered so much. Like, how can I go to this uh, school that I really want to and get a higher education when my people are suffering so much. So we see a lot of our younger folks start college and they drop out because they feel so guilty that they can't have something because our people are suffering. What we wanna switch people to is you can have this commitment to help your people and whatever you need to do to do that, you would include yourself with that that you're also helping yourself, your family, your community, and that you deserve to have joy in your life. Our ancestors did not want us to be suffering. And so that's an important part of that.
I would just like to a say that- A lot of people have jumped on the historical trauma bandwagon, we say, and they have distortions about it, what it is, the definitions, the practices, things like that. And that is important for us to make sure we, we set the record straight because work on historical trauma is not about staying stuck in the past. And that's some of the critiques I've heard. It's not about that at all. It's, it's recognizing our pain, the trauma and transcending it, working it through so that we don't stay stuck in the past as our tribal people and we we have concepts of the seven generations and the healing across seven generations and how it takes that time that that's why it's important to have the knowledge about the historically traumatic events and how it still affects us today and that's part of the healing process so that it is an original intent was to provide healing not to stay stuck in the past to also reclaim our traditional cultural protective factors. And we had many where our tribes were very, very resilient across the board and to help us to stop identifying as victims and moved from that to an identity as survivors and then beyond of transcending and thriving. So it's a process. And we do incorporate recognition of and encourage, encourage resilience and being able to process trauma. So we can't emphasize resilience without also acknowledging the trauma and the process of healing of that. We can't just jump to, oh, I'm resilient and not have done with any of our work on our own trauma and how that's affected us and healing from that. And we do recognize and respect tribal differences and also that each tribal community has to integrate with their own tribal cultures and healing how they are going to manage incorporating the work on historical trauma. But we kind of laid out some possibilities and things that we felt were working in our tribes. So the original historical trauma intervention we developed was among the Lakota, but we respect the right of all different tribal communities to come up with things that work for them. But I think a lot of tribes are embracing the concept of historical trauma and historical unresolved grief. And because there have been distorted information out there, that's been damaging to the whole concept. And we want to try to correct that with uh, education about it, that it's not about just staying stuck in the past. We've worked with not only across the US, but quite a few things in Canada. And Josie was in some other places that she had the fortune of being able to visit with some of the international community. Hi, this is Dr. Chase. I just wanted to make a comment and I will talk more about this, but if we could briefly go back to the um, slide on the trauma response features. Um, or we don't have to go there. I just wanted to add that um, in our Iwankapia um, study and in some other work that we will, will share our initial intervention that, you know, in fact, our participants did have high rates of um, trauma exposure, um, multiple losses, depression, anxiety, and um, so that, you know, this really plays out in our life today in, you know, 2022. However, I would also like to say that when we talk about resilience, you know, in 1492, we had everything we needed to take care of ourselves, to heal ourselves and keep ourselves healthy. The medicines, the rites, the rituals and the ceremonies you know, to heal ourselves and subsequent to that, you know, um, all of that was eroded 
So today we do integrate all of those things into our healing interventions. And um, I, I also wanted to comment on the kind of um, stereotype of the stoic Indian. You know, that's part of this trauma response and it, it's called psychic numbing that, you know, in order to survive, we've had to shut down a lot of our emotions and um, operate, you know, kind of in a field of limited emotions in order to manage um, all these layers of trauma and loss. Thank you. This was from a, a pamphlet that was developed in 1990, and it was around the Sitting Bull and Bigfoot Memorial Ride. This was really a very well-written document. It was a short document, but it was talking about our healing, and that basically we're saying that Takini is to be reborn, and that we can give hope to our people through the historical trauma and unresolved grief intervention and other kinds of things and bringing back a lot of our sacredness, our ceremonies. And that's been going on for a long time now. But it just says to let a hundred drums gather. It must be a time of celebration, of living, of rebuilding, and of moving on. Our warriors will sing a new song, a song of a new beginning, a song of victory. Let our warriors sing clear and loud so that the heartbeat of our people will be heard by Sitting Bull and all our ancestors in the spirit world. Let us send to our great chief a new song to sing when he rides around the people in the spirit world. Look at our children, they're going to live again. They're going to live again. Sitting Bull says this as he rides. So it's really inspirational for us and this keeps us grounded in our work, in our lives, and what's really important. I would like to add that, you know, we've, I guess, consulted our, our relatives, our ancestors, um, to, and asked for guidance, you know, in our ceremonies, and that we really feel that um, you know, they guide our work and um, help us um, to, to conduct um, healing and to share with, um, you know, the families of today and the children um, so that we can return to, you know, mending the sacred hoop. Thank you. And so in our work, the healing is starting out in this model in the West, confronting the past, our historical trauma and embracing our history and making peace with it in whatever way that we can, because we can't go back and change those things, but we can go back and heal those things. And then the next, Part of that is the understanding the trauma. So, and that's looking at the trauma response features and how it affects us and how we deal with it and how we can heal with it and then releasing our pain and then transcending the trauma. And these actually the order and the colors of the directions that's used in the Sitting Bull Sundance. So these, these things are very sacred. I know every tribe and, and even within the same tribes and depends on the healers, which order the colors go and which colors are in the, the medicine wheel. But I just wanted to mention that because this is why we have the colors there that we do have. So we'll, um, I guess, talk about this journey that we embarked upon um, in working together uh, when we came together in the mid 80s and then um, started, you know, 
fleshing out, I guess, the, the model that we work with and where we are today. So, um, you know, our, our foundational um, endeavor is for the reduction in the sense of feeling responsible to undo our painful historical past to decrease the shame, stigma, anger, sadness, and guilt of what happened to our people. And, um, you know, that we could have done more about it to change it. And um, in, in 1992, our first intervention was conducted here in the sacred Black Hills in South Dakota. And um, we brought together 40 um, grassroots healers uh, from several tribal um, programs in, in the D Dakotas as well as maybe Nebraska and Montana. And um, it was um, based on Dr. Braveheart's dissertation. And, um, and so these were the outcomes. So that was our first intervention in 1992, and we've continued to build and disseminate the work since that time. So I lost track of how many years that is now, but it's a long time. So um, going back to our intent um, to increase the joy and sense of personal power in valuing the, our true selves and our tribes. Um, an increased sense of parental competence, increase um, the use of our tr traditional language, um, increase communication with, you know, the participants' own parents and grandparents about historical trauma. Um, we found improved relationships between children, parents, and grandparents, and the extended um, kinship ne network. So it's really rebuilding our Tioshpaye, um, the interconnection, our, our um, extended family, our, our network of interdependency within our communities, our families, our tribes. Um, through the intervention, we found that people experienced an increased pride in being Lakota and valuing one's culture, um, for example, the seven laws that we were given to live by, such as generosity, um, compassion, you know, to have a great mind. And that goes back to what the statement I made earlier about us having everything that we needed to care for ourselves. So in our language, there's a deep understanding in and knowledge about life and how to um, live a healthy, positive life um, with oneself and, you know, in relationship to all of um, humanity and, you know, the um, four legged and the plants, you know, the earth, our mother earth. So um, I'll talk more about these findings from that 1992 study. There were um, some really important findings, but um, I guess we can move on to that. Um, and so um, we found that there were some gender differences for um, the emotions that people experienced before, during, and after the intervention. So we see that, you know, there we looked at anger, sadness, guilt, shame, and joy. And the striking, a couple of the striking findings were that um, in relation to anger, um, during, well, initially the male and female were about the same, the participants in their feelings of anger. But during, um, there was a, uh, a large difference between females and um, being in touch with their anger at 41% and males 
at 66%. And then at the end of the intervention, they expressed a large reduction in the sense of anger. And I think that has come through working through, through um, the trauma, having a better understanding of it, and feeling um, relieved of, of doing that and a sense of hope for the future. So you see that 11.8% for females and 26% for males. So this really led us to um, know that we're on track. The other one would be, um, I think with sadness, um, they were close at, beginning and then at the end um, there was like a 65 percent reduction in their feelings of um, sadness for the females and you know 50 percent reduction for the males and that's really significant and I think I glossed over because I thought it was going to be on here but we found that um, the number of victims of sexual abuse in boarding school was a lot higher for men than for women. And we were surprised to find that. So that just shows, you know, that our, our men experienced a lot of um, abuse and shame, you know, not only by having um, their role as uh, protectors and providers taken away and, and, you know, being subjugated to boarding school, but also the victimization that occurred there. And you can see the results there. Thank you. So um, the study that I've been um, referring to called Iwangapia the NIMH pilot clinical trial, um, it Iwankapia means healing. Um, so our purpose was to reduce the emotional suffering among American Indians by developing an intervention model that improves treatment for depression, unresolved grief, and PTSD. So those are the highest, um, what we call, um, diagnoses for um, mental unhealth, I guess you would say, among our people. And that's been our focus um, throughout these, you know, 30 plus years of work with healing historical trauma and unresolved grief is to, you know, imp improve the health of our people, the mental health. So before that, you know, there wasn't a lot of information or it, it was a lot of misinformation about American Indians. And, um, and we felt like we need to take ownership of the work that happens to treat our people as well as the, um, what the research, you know, re the research process has been abused in working with American Indians and then the publication of that information should be done by our people and ourselves. So we um, just um, <clears throat> conducted the study at two sites, one Southwest urban site and one Northern Plains uh, rural reservation site. And we combined an evidence-based um, model or intervention called interpersonal group psychotherapy. And we integrated or combined that with our historical trauma and unresolved grief model and compared that to the um, IPT only or interpersonal psychotherapy only. And we um, did this at the um, two clinical sites. So we can move on to the findings, the um, preliminary themes and findings from our study we think are important and really validated a lot of what we know uh, about our people and um, clinical healing work. 
So um, the group engagement scores, um, that means the, that the people really um, kind of, um, there was cohesion among the group and a lot of sharing um, kind of um, support and um, relationship building. And that was higher for the um, combined historical trauma and IPT group than for the IPT only. And um, I think that tells us and gives us a sense of direction that having our culture, um, you know, our ceremonies, our um, history integrated into treatment is really important and people really respond to that. Um, people saw our tribal culture, um, traditional culture as protective factors such as we, you know, used the seven laws for guidelines for um, running the group, um, you know, having compassion, um, being generous with our time, our knowledge, and um, all and, and the smudging, the um, songs, the prayers that we used as um, protected people from from the depression and um, trauma, and that they can take that as they go forward in life. Um, we just had a lot of positive response from the participants. Um, people were really dedicated to um, attendance and participation. For example, one um, woman had to, didn't have a ride, so she hitchhiked to the group and it was like 60 miles or something. Another participant um, was unable to make group one evening, but she came earlier in the day and drove like 30 miles to tell us that she wouldn't be able to make the group you know, because she had such a commitment to, to the group. Another important thing was that the providers or the facilitators um, preferred the historical trauma model um, to the IPT only. Um, even a couple of non-native uh, providers stated that they preferred the historical trauma model. And um, so just we, we found that this really validated that um, people respond to the model. They like not being alone in their depression. There's a reduction of stigma. Um, when we look at the collective context of our historical past and there a, was a decrease in depression. And um, so it really validated I guess the efficacy of our historical trauma and unresolved grief model. Okay, we can move on to the next slide. So um, these are just some pictures that we, when we talk about resilience and building resilience, these are some efforts that um, began in Lakota country in um, 1990 when uh, the Bigfoot Memorial writers um, followed the route or commemorated the 100th anniversary of Sitting Bull's death and the Wounded Knee Massacre by following the route and uh, doing a spiritual, four day spiritual ride. Um, for healing. And I think Maria talks about that more in the next slide, perhaps. Okay, um, so I'll just say that um, this was a vision by an elder who, um, who was very active in the community. So he was the lead Bigfoot Memorial writer, and he was always um, somebody, he was very knowledgeable um, in the culture, the language and spirituality, and people looked to him always for guidance. And he carried a responsibility for, um, 
for healing and, and helping people in the community. So, um, <clears throat> so he um, initiated that ride that went on for four years. And um, he also participated in our initial intervention in 1992 in the Black Hills. And so um, he talks about himself as, as a wounded healer, meaning he experienced the wounding, the depression, the loss, the grief, his family history. And um, he made the statement, which I think is so powerful. I sacrificed to wipe the tears of the people, but until today, no one had wiped my tears. So um, he really felt that his um, woundedness was acknowledged and, and healed. So that just, I guess, is a testament to um, the experience of participating in our four day intervention. And that's how we approach healing is that we do our own work. We look at our own trauma, um, the trauma in our families, in our grandparents, great grandparents, our boarding school history, you know, the early deaths, the massacres, all of that, and um, face it because we believe that you can't take anybody any further in their healing than what you have gone through. So that's our approach. We can move on to the next slide. So I want to introduce Mr. Regis Pecos, who's going to speak to some of the present day traumas and threats that we face. We've heard about the foundation and we'll ask him to uh, start us off as we move towards resilience. Thank you. Thank you. And let me just first uh, say thank you and how much I appreciate the context that our colleagues provided in, in, in the kind of intergenerational trauma that continues uh, presently. And so the Leadership Institute uh, that I co-founded based at the Santa Fe Indian School, which is one of the remnants of boarding schools established in 1890. Um, this slide just really reflects in a recent series of community institutes on the impacts of COVID. But you can see that the way that people reflect it upon their experience um, during this time that's not yet over, you know, one of the major events um, uh, that has disproportionately impacted our, our people. But this really is a reflection about the continued ways in which the history of policies and laws intentionally created to dismantle our own systems and institutions continue to manifest in ways that create poverty, that create hunger, that create health disparities, cycles of violence, and ultimately culminating in a sense of hopelessness when we see Native youth um, being the highest among those who take their own lives. And so uh, as we continue to move forward, um, you know, I'll be sharing the ways in which we are shifting, um, attempting to shift the paradigm with the complexity of, of, the, of the ways in which the past manifests into current challenges, understanding that uh, the challenges we face today are deeply embedded in our history. And so this is uh, an, an area where we are shifting to move and work with young people in intentional ways to create a sense of love of who they are, a sense of love for their language and culture and ground them and root them in the things that were part of the gifts of our creator using a core values paradigm as the basis of their response and everything that 
they do uh, in their decision-making process. If we go to the next slide. Thank you. So now we are going to be moving into our healing in action, the journey of healing. And we're going to hear a piece, an audio piece from Mr. Robert Brown. So there's a lot of things with what happened to our people. And, and like I said earlier, what we're looking to do is to try to rekindle our, ourselves, our nations back to becoming a big fire again, you know, bringing ourselves back to that. So with saying that, when we address that part of when we say our fire, our fire is in regards to our heart. That's where our fire is, you know. And in speaking, like I was saying earlier, that when a family member passes, their fire, they're all connected. And then one diminishes, part of the fire diminishes. It sort of like becomes dismantled. It's not together as it should be. And so then because of it, it's sort of like all over the place because now each family member goes through various things of not understanding what has just happened. You know, it can be a child, it can be a, a youth, it can be an adult, and it can be an elder within our families. And when that happens, it, that family fire is dismantled. And so the thing is that uh, those of us, we say the clear-minded, so their understanding is the ones who are clear-minded in a sense is they bring back that family fire and they rekindle their fire so that their fire can burn bright again as it once did before even though that one part of them has diminished but they still have to carry on because again we always have to look to those faces that we say that are coming yet to be born here upon this earth. And we say that their faces are within the earth yet, that they're waiting to be born. And so it's like, it's sort of like it's a continuation. You know, our elders teach us that since time immemorial, whether we refer to the beginning as origin or creation, or as Pueblo people, uh, the time of emergence, our creator gifted to us all that would be necessary to sustain uh, us in our life journey in this physical world, having come from the spiritual world into the, the physical world. And the gifts of the creator our, our mother earth upon which we set foot, that we're connected to that define ultimately who we are, language that is the most precious gift that allows us to, to, to recognize our purpose in life and meaning in life, our, our way of life and our governance systems um, that, that provide for the relationship of all living things, and certainly the indigenous laws and customs that allow for the maintenance of the balance of these relationships. And of course, family as the ultimate receiver of the precious gift of children, um, the, the spirit that allows for humanity to continue as well as the community that we all become members of that are responsible for nurturing the minds and the hearts of our children and all of the resources symbolized by water as the ultimate giver of life. And so our elders teach us that every generation um, is, is responding to the challenges uh, and, and the greatest expression of the love of the gifts of the creator is how we respond to the challenge for the maintenance of all the gifts of the creator. And so this is a photo of Pueblo leaders fighting for one protecting Pueblo lands in the 1920s on the north side of our nation's capital in Washington, DC. 
And so this epitomizes that um, as we are of the generation of today, in similar ways, uh, we embrace uh, the challenges that every other generation has embraced to respond to the challenges of their time and in their response defines the greatest love to protect and be guardians and stewards of all of the gifts of the creator. And so now is our time to do the same. Future generations will reflect upon this time and how well we responded to the challenges to sustain and define the, the future inheritance of the gifts of our creator for future generations. And so as, as we move to embrace um, the, the challenges today that are deeply embedded uh, in the history, in the ways in which policies and, and laws manifest into every conceivable way that our colleagues have presented a contextual setting to understand and appreciate that the ways that uh, people over generations have been affected, um, define who we are today. And the question that becomes paramount in how we respond to, to the challenges today are these questions in our Leadership Institute that ask the question, what, what will our children inherit from us really is dependent upon the decisions we make today. And we use a 100 year timeline to look at the past 100 years and the way that we are personally connected uh, to our parents, our grandparents, great grandparents and elders and ancestors of our communities and what they overcame to the very present. And as we ask, what does the next 100 years look like? Well, what we do today, the decisions we make today uh, is already affecting uh, where we are today with our children, our grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. So 100 years into the future is not some distant uh, part of our future. It is happening and being defined today by how we respond. And one of the most critical questions is what kind of caretakers will our children become? Will they be loving, respectful, and compassionate? Well, the answer to that really profound question really depends on what we do today. And so our Leadership Institute focuses on responding to a, a statement that reflects um, that whoever controls the minds and the hearts of our children controls our destiny. And so we are shifting in how we deal with uh, young people, caretakers of our communities um, in the future by engaging them intentionally in creating new programs and new contextual settings that transfers um, the, the, the breadth of, uh, of what has survived over time so that we are using our strengths to build upon in the decisions that we make today and nurturing the minds and the hearts of young people is a very intentional part in defining what kind of caretakers our children will become as a necessary paradigm shift to look at the complexity of what um, our colleagues have created in this contextual framing of how generations have been subjected to the intentionality of destroying systems and institutions as a deliberate process of assimilating us and where we are today in our journey. Uh, it's remarkable that language has survived as our way of life has survived and continues to be the very heart of our cultural survival. But what we do to nurture the minds and the hearts of young people is especially important in the work that we do. So as we hear from Regis and the Pueblo outlook on the future and hopes for children, we move back to Ethleen's description of Lakota ceremonies and ways. 
She notes that most indigenous groups relate to nature as relatives and the Lakota people have a sacred tree that is always treated with ceremony and respect and even used in the Sundance uh, ceremony. Um, in this graphic, we can see the roots represent a person's way of being both good and bad. And she actually had a much more illustrative uh, discussion of how that tree that's used during the Sundance ceremony is uh, prayed over and um, thanked for its use and used in the ceremony and move forward. But we're going to move on now to her discussion of their hopes for their children's future. So next slide, please. We have a hope for the future. Our hope, our prayer for the future is that this little boy will become an elder male. And this elder male will be a strong, healthy elder, that he will be one that we could turn to for teachings, for guidance, for strength, for uh, being, you know, somebody to go to whenever we, we need, um, you know, cultural teachings, when we need spiritual strength. This little girl, we hope and pray that she will become an elder woman. And again, that elder woman, you know, to somebody that would be a healthy elder that would uh, be able to provide the teachings to, you know, provide safety, security that would represent our seven sacred laws, you know, all of that. In our language, we have a saying, it's wichachchala na winuchchala otapikte. So how do we get there? You know, how do we get to be a wichachchala, which is elder, an elder man, or a winuchchala, which is an elder woman? Otapikte mean, means there will be many. There will be many elder men and elder women. That's our hope. That's our prayer. And how we get there is um, all of those ceremonies that was described in that uh, first four stages of life graphic, where the child will be cherished, will be welcomed, will be afforded every ceremony that they can to help them grow into that healthy elder. And we also have a saying that you know, whenever people stayed close to the ceremonies, like say the Inipi, the purification ceremony, the, the Sunnat ceremonies, all of the ceremonies that we have, then there were many elder men and elder women. That's how we stayed strong. And we didn't become overwhelmed by the negative influences that are out there. So this hope and this prayer for the future is, I think, something that we share among all Indigenous nations, that our children will have everything they need to be healthy and happy, and that they will grow into healthy, strong, wise elders. Next slide, Mark. Apie Wichoti was a community grassroots response that happened in um, Oglala Sioux tribal lands and also a partnership with other holy men throughout the traditional communities in, in Rosebud and Pine Ridge. And um, there was a lot of suicide going on and some of the grassroots organizations thought it was important to um, go into ceremony and the ceremony we always make sure to address the ancestors and the ancestors uh, wish for these dreams to come true here. And this Techa uh, Wapie Wichoti was one of the goals to come. So uh, talked about Wopa um, Kinte, wiping off the trauma of the spirit and, uh, you know, bringing identity to have a Lakota spiritual name so we can uh, enhance uh, self-efficacy and self-identity and healing of, of historical trauma. Next page. Next slide, please. We chote we keep the camp goal is 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 uh, really to promote healing and what chante ognake is to uh, help create a warm environment for the youth. There's a lot of things we concentrate like talking circles, uh, teach them about the teachings of the bow and arrow. Um, there's a buffalo hunt that happens. It's all guided by ceremony, and also the kids get to have fun. 
uh, get to watch a movie or uh, do fun things, do games. Wapie is uh, wiping off the trauma, the spirit. And these ceremonies were done through our holy men. Um, <clears throat> fortunately, our our communities still have uh, contact with their ceremonies and can uh, access that uh, that healing energy through the ceremonies. Wopakinte was really one that happens when uh, every every uh, pers person that comes into the camp, uh, whether uh, they're youth or an adult, adolescent, they get a Wopakinte and a wife's to trauma off the spirit. Wuyushki is a happy, fun, and accepting environment. Lakota Chashwesh Wichatrupi is a getting the Lakota spiritual name. We're promoting the Wachosani good health, Wawashake, and strengthening the strength based approach. Next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you, Leon, for that context again. In our Leadership Institute, um, we recognize that we are now into about 130 years of the continuance of what started in 1890 with the first introduction of the Indian education policy that was built on the mantra that the way you kill language and the way you kill culture is to remove the children from their language and culture and deny those children their language and culture. And that was the beginning of the boarding school era. And when we think about the reality today that 90% of all of our children are enrolled in public schools across Indian country, where only 1% to 2% at best of all teachers teaching our children to be Native American. The reality is that for the majority of our children, they will never see a Native teacher in their classroom K through 12. So one of the very intentional ways in which we are reclaiming uh, what we desire that our children learn. Much of what has been uh, this discussion today is not taught in, in public 